Well, in a moment, Rachel's gonna be speaking to us, continuing our series on foundation, and we love stories of belonging, and that's part of what we're looking at today. And so we'd love you to watch this video from Callum about he's, how he's found belonging in Gas Street, what it's meant for him. So watch this video, uh, and then Rachel will come speak to us. When I came to uni, there was loads of new experiences, uh, and the level of, particularly the level of independence um, that I, I'd never had before. There's so many expectations of you to meet new people and make new friends. I was going out socializing, I was drinking, and actually at the, at the time, this was brilliant. I was having a whale of a time. I remember kind of slipping a little bit into this party culture, experimenting with different things and some things that I probably wouldn't have thought I'd, I would have done. But I woke up uh, one morning thinking, this is not how I thought it would feel like. I remember feeling um, empty, lost, um, without purpose, and um, it wasn't really what I expected at all. I, I remember coming along to church on a Sunday because um, one of my family friends had invited me to Gas Street. I kind of felt like a bit of an imposter. I really wrestled and struggled with this and it really felt quite uncomfortable and confusing. If I have to be honest, I really didn't want to go on the student weekend away. And again, even the first day at the student weekend away, I kind of had those similar feelings um, of a little bit of emptiness. Um, and actually it was on the second day um, where I remember I suddenly just felt this overwhelming sense of the spirit like I'd never had before. I remember being in uncontrollable floods of tears, um, but actually I've never encountered God like that. I knew that I had to or wanted to do something different. I wanted to live differently. The thing that I felt, felt most in that moment was um, the love of God just pouring over me despite anything that I'd ever done that I was actually a son of God um, and that there was just this overwhelming sense of forgiveness. Um, and it was, there was nothing that I could actually do that would take that away. I remember coming to church each week uh, and actually in that moment feeling really challenged and convicted and motivated um, to kind of give some of this stuff up and actually choose Jesus over those kind of things. But nearly immediately the next day, as I kind of dropped myself back into uni life, it, it would almost feel like an instant where I'd, I got it wrong again. And this cycle was just repeating, repeating, repeating itself. Um, and it was draining, it was emotionally draining um, for, for me. Yeah, I ended up joining Gas Street St. Luke's kids team and um, it was really fun, it was um, exciting. And actually having that level of responsibility was also um, really helpful for me. Um, it kind of plunged me deeper into my relationship with Jesus and actually being able to share that with some of the kids was transformational. Even having walked with Jesus um, for a bit of time now, there were so many other things that I would turn to for comfort, um, that I would rely on and depend on and turn to for strength um, in moments of weakness. It was in my third year, my final year of university, and I was at another student gathering um, on a Tuesday. Again, I really significantly encountered uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, uh, and it was this point where he uh, freed me from a lot of the stuff I'd been wrestling with and engaging with and actually had been dependent on. It wasn't an overnight transformation for me. Um, as I leaned into him and as I kind of surrendered that to him, uh, I'm a completely different person from who I was. I'm just so grateful for the community that uh, has been at Gastry, um, for my friends that I've made, for the people, uh, for the older, more mature people that have journeyed alongside me, um, for the groups I've been a part of, for the groups I've led. Um, and I'm actually working at a youth charity um, who, uh, in Erdington called Urban Devotion Birmingham who exists to, to see the transformation of communities one life at a time. Um, and it's so exciting to be part of that and, and actually get to see young people come to know Jesus themselves. Yeah, Jesus is everything to me. He, he gives me purpose, he gives me relationship, he, he gives me intimacy. He has done so much in me over the last four years um, that I can't even really describe. He's, brought uh, peace to my life, he's brought purpose, he's brought joy. The biggest difference that Jesus had made in my life is actually, I now know that um, what anyone else thinks of me um, is secondary to what he thinks of me, and actually that I can surrender everything to him, that I can trust him. He is my father, and I am his son. Amazing, amen. Amen. Well, 
Uh, it is great to, it's great to see you all um, this morning. It is still just about, oh no, it's not this morning, every time, um, every time. Uh, it's great to see you this afternoon. And if you were here last week, you'll know uh, that we're in our vision series. And this is a time each year where we spend a couple of weeks just focusing in on the vision, the vision that God gave us for this church, to remind ourselves of that vision, uh, to pray into the vision, to give to the vision. Uh, and of course, the vision is light for the city and beyond. That's the call, that's the vision that we sent God give us, uh, inspired by the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 14, where Jesus says, you, you are the light of the world. And then a bit further on, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's why we're here. We're called to be light. And as a church, we know that call is to be light for the city and beyond. And that was the vision God gave us eight years ago uh, when Gas Street first started. And we are still compelled by that vision it still gets us up in the morning. We know that there is still so much more to come. And of course, the outworking of that vision looks like being a church uh, that gathers and Sc scatters, scatters. That's the missing word. Gathers and scatters. Just checking you're all paying attention then. And so we're light with this light that Jesus talks about. We're light when we gather like this and in other spaces throughout the week. Uh, we're light when we scatter wherever God has placed us from our Monday through to our Saturday, whatever context, community, people group God has called us to through the week. We are, we are the light as we scatter in Jesus' name. And the good news is it's working. God is at work. I mean, Callum's story is just one illustration, one person to demonstrate God at work in individual lives in and through our church. If you've seen the publication, every year we produce a publication uh, just to celebrate all that God has done and is doing in our church over the last 12 months. And if you've picked up the publication, you'll have read that 218 people over the last 12 months said yes to following Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's amazing. Over the last 12 months, 211 people, no, sorry, 110 people might be more than that next year. Uh, 110 people were baptized over the last 12 months. Isn't that amazing? And then 6,005, 6, I'm struggling with my numbers this morning. 6,500 meals have been provided. 211 debts have been relieved through our work at Love Your Neighbor. God is on the move, and God is also on the move through the scatter when we go. As you know, we've been doing these scatter sessions the last few weeks, and what we're seeing is more and more people from our church being mobilized to go and share their faith, uh, uh, to, to go and pray for people all over the place, outside of here, all over over the place, uh, and it's so encouraging to hear about people who've been coming to this church for ages, who have been Christians for ages, who have never had the courage or the conviction to go and do it, to go and pray for people, to go and share faith with people, and we're hearing the stories coming in, and it's happening in Wagamamas, of all places. It's happening at the McDonald's drive through at beauty salons, at hairdressers. We, we clearly like to look after ourselves at this church. It's happening in workplaces, in school classrooms. We're hearing what the youth are up to, sharing their faith. It's happening in university campuses. It's amazing. God is on the move through the gather and the scatter. One woman who was at our scatter sessions uh, here at Central on Wednesday, she shared the story 
about how one of her work colleagues had come into work that week and he was so low, so despondent, and he just found out that he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And he was devastated. He was worried that he might lose his job. Uh, And Rebecca, the woman that shared this story on Wednesday, uh, she said she just felt prompted by the Holy Spirit in that moment to say to this work colleague, look, you know I'm a Christian. Uh, I'll pray for you. And he nodded. And then she felt the Holy Spirit prompt her again, like pray for him now. And so she plucked up the courage and said, look, I, I could actually pray for you now if you like. And she said that she kind of hoped that he would say no because it was busy at work and there were loads of other people around. But to her surprise, he said, yeah, okay. And so she put a hand on his shoulder and she prayed a simple prayer in the name of Jesus. And not only did he say he felt a sense of peace, but a work colleague over her shoulder who had overheard what was going on a work colleague who Rebecca knew to be a staunch atheist at the end of the prayer let out a resounding amen. I love that. God is on the move. And so the vision is to be light for the city and that's out work through the gather and the scatter, but we also know that the vision that God has given us to be light goes beyond the city. It goes beyond the city because there is a unique call on this church to be a resource, to resource the wider church, to resource the church across the UK. And we we do that through ministries like The Orchard. We do that through worship for everyone, through gas street music, And we also do that by being a church that has the privilege of welcoming and hosting guests, visitors, every Sunday. Visitors from other churches. Every Sunday, there were people that that come to this church to receive, to be refreshed, so that they can go back ready to serve at their local churches, in their local context. And it is a huge privilege to serve the wider church in that way. But here's the thing. I need to warn you that this is one of those straight talking kind of talks. Is that okay? But as as we've prayed, as we've discerned the vision over the last couple of months, as, as we've since God speaking to us specifically about this season in the life of the church, this chapter in the life of our church, what we've sensed is God speak to us about deepening the foundations. We've sensed God speak to us about strengthening the core, about building better. And you know, often what happens at this time of year when we present uh, the vision We often share with you new and exciting ministry opportunities uh, that we wanna step into, that that we wanna resource so that we can run after. And uh, and if you remember the last two years, we've called this vision series Above and Beyond. And the invitation has been uh, to invite the whole church to go above and beyond in order to see vision become a reality, in order to see some of these new ministry opportunities come to life. And we may well do that again, but this year, what we've sensed is to do something different. And we realize on the one hand, of course, we always wanna invite people to go above and beyond because, because as the vision grows, as the vision expands, our faith needs to grow. The resource needs to expand. But what we've come to realize is as the church has grown, and listen to this, in the last 12 months, the the church has grown by 23%. 23% in the last 12 months. And as we've grown, as new people have joined, the majority of our church, I wonder if the invitation needs to be not to go above and beyond, but actually to step into the main and the plain. You know, we were tempted to call the whole vision series the main and the plain, but it didn't quite 
get past our comms team. So foundations it is. And we started asking the question, what if every single person who comes to Gas Street regularly, what if every single person who calls Gas Street home, what if everyone simply did the main and the plain? And the main and the plain is belonging, serving, giving. Because belonging, serving, giving, these are the basics of what it means to be part of a church family. Belonging, serving, giving. This is not above and beyond. Belonging, serving, giving. This is the main and the plain. These are just the foundation markers of what it means to be part of a church family. Let me say again that our church has grown by 23% in the last 12 months alone. And yet, only a quarter of those people that come regularly to Gas Street belong to a group currently. Only a quarter of those people that come to Gas Street regularly serve on a team. Only a quarter of those people that come to Gas Street give regularly financially. And we have done the calculations and humanly speaking, it is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. And if a proportion, a good proportion of our church are not doing the basics, the, the main and the plain, that the foundations of what it means to be part of a church, then we are seriously limited with what we can build on. That's the truth, that's the reality. On, on the other hand, on the other hand, if everyone who comes to Gas Street regularly if everyone who calls this church home, if everyone committed to the basics, the, the main and the plain, the foundations of belonging, serving, giving, well, the impact could be incalculable. The impact could be huge. And so today, I wanna talk about two of those foundations, belonging and serving. And next week, Nick's gonna share on the foundation of giving, and we're gonna create an opportunity, an invitation for each one of us to step in and present our giving towards the vision. If you were here last week, uh, we played Ashley's story. And in the video, Ashley talked about how when she started coming to Gas Street regularly for quite a while before she joined a group and before she started serving on a team, she would have described herself as one foot in. One foot in. That's how she would have described her relationship to Gas Street Church. And I've been thinking a lot about that phrase, one foot in. And I wonder if there might be a whole bunch of people, in fact, the data tells us that there are a whole bunch of people who perhaps, if you're honest, you know you've been coming to church for a while, but you are still just one foot in, one foot in. And maybe there are good reasons why you've been coming for a while and, and you are still one foot in. And Maybe it's because you're hesitant. There are good reasons why you are hesitant to put both feet in. Maybe you have been hurt by church before. Maybe you don't feel good enough. Maybe you feel like you have got nothing to offer and so it's just easier and safer to keep one foot in and one foot in. Out. Maybe you're scared. Maybe you don't know what's expected of you. Maybe you're thinking, if I do put one foot in, will I be liked? Will I be wanted? Will I be needed? Will I be disappointed? Will I be let down? And maybe for others, you are one foot in right now because you're hurting. 
because you're burnt out. And right now you are one foot in because you just need to heal. You just need to receive. Maybe you're one foot in because you're new. You're new around here. You've only been coming a couple of weeks. You're, you're maybe exploring faith. You're trying to figure out whether you believe this stuff or not. And yes, we fully acknowledge that there are short seasons where it is okay. It is, it's appropriate to be one foot in, but I have my suspicions that there might be others. And if you're really honest, what one foot in actually means is, I love coming to church on a Sunday to worship, but I am not interested in serving. Perhaps if you're honest, what one foot in actually means is I love being part of a big church with a big vision, but it doesn't really suit my needs right now to get more involved. I'm just gonna keep one foot in because it suits me better that way. Here's the thing about church. Church really doesn't work for very long with only one foot in because either you'll fall over or the church will fall over. In essence, in essence, if we continually choose uh, to just remain one foot in, week in, week out, maybe month in, month out, maybe even year in, year out, what we're effectively saying is, I believe in Jesus, but I don't wanna belong to his church. Thank you very much. That is a major problem. It's a problem for you and it's a problem for this church. Because the Word of God, when we open the Scriptures, when we read through the New Testament, it, it makes it abundantly clear that we can never separate believing from belonging. They are intrinsically connected. Let me read some scriptures to you from the New Testament. Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. 1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 2 Corinthians 8, 5, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. Ephesians 2, 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And finally, Hebrews 6.10, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you've shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Are you getting the picture? We cannot separate believing from belonging. You know this phrase, one another and each other? It appears over 50 times in the New Testament. Love, pray, encourage, admonish, greet, serve, teach, accept, honor, bear with, forgive, sing to, submit, be devoted to one another, to each other. You cannot separate believing from belonging. To be a Christian is to believe and to belong. Pastor Rick Warren, a well-known pastor in America, he tells the story of preaching this message at his church one Sunday. And the message was about surrendering our whole lives to Jesus, giving our whole lives to Jesus, every part, our time, our money, our ambitions, our habits, our careers, our relationships, our home, everything. And the response was to fill out this card, a whole life commitment to Jesus card. 
and they were collected up at the end. And what surprised Rick Warren wasn't that so many people filled out the card, but what surprised him is that there was a significant number who filled out this card, surrendering the whole of their lives to Jesus, who had never given financially to the church, had never served on a team at the church, and had never joined a midweek group at the church. And he noted his, he noted his concern about how many people were able to, to declare whole life commitments to Jesus, but didn't seem to prepare to simply belong and serve and give at their own local church. We cannot separate believing from belonging. And, and the truth is, as a leadership team over the last few months, we've had to ask some pretty hard, confronting, important, necessary questions are we doing enough to create opportunities for belonging? Have we missed something? Have we got things wrong? Are we set up, are we adequately set up as a church right now to prioritize belonging, to make belonging easy? And we recognize that we've missed stuff that in some ways, the answer to that question is, there's more we could do. We recognize that it hasn't always been our strength. And, and yet there's also some other factors, some other dynamics at play. Truth is, over the years, I have had multiple conversations with people on a Sunday who have said to me, look, I've been coming to this church for a while, but I'm really struggling to connect in. And you know, my heart breaks as the pastor here, my heart breaks to hear that. Like, I hate that. And there could be some really important reasons why that hasn't happened. But honestly, more often than not, this is how the conversation goes. Someone says, look, I'm struggling to connect in here uh, on a Sunday. Uh, and I will say, well, well, are you part of a group? And they'll say, no, I'm not part of a group. And I'll say, well, well, well then are you serving on a team? And they'll say, no, no, I'm not serving on a team. You see, belonging has to go beyond Sunday. We know for a church this size with multiple gatherings and uh, multiple locations and multiple visitors every Sunday, creating meaningful connection, deep sense of belonging, it has its challenges. Trust us, we know. But there is another challenge, there's another dynamic, and that's that we live in a country that is in the middle of a loneliness crisis. We are living through a loneliness crisis pandemic, and one of the reasons is because it is symptomatic of being in a culture that values individualism way higher than community. We, we breathe the oxygen of being in a culture that values consumerism, it's all about me, way more than what it means to serve one another, to love one another. And as Christians, we, we desperately need to resist that value system. It is so counter to the gospel. It is so counter to what it means to be church. And as a church, we don't wanna settle. We don't ever just wanna accept things that the, the way that they are. We're not meant to be an event that people just attend in isolation on a Sunday. Honestly, let us just pack up and go home if that's what we become. We wanna be a church family and we wanna do everything that we can. We wanna play our part in creating a space where people can find belonging. And so some of the questions that we've been asking ourselves, we've been looking at everything, the whole church, everything that we do, and it's led us to, to rethink one of the key mechanisms, the key vehicles that we have to create that sense of belonging outside of Sunday. And it's the gastric groups. 
And if you've been part of a gastric group to date, you will know that the way it works is you sign up to a group for a term, and then the term ends, and then there's a gap, and then new groups start, and you sign up again for a term, and then the group ends. And also, each group does something different. Here's what we sense, is the time has come to move away from that style of midweek group. You know, it served us well for a time, but we recognize that it is not facilitating the kind of belonging that we want to, that we want to create as part of this church. And so we are relaunching our gastric groups in April as gastric communities. And I know the cynics amongst you will be thinking they've just changed the name. I promise you, we really want the emphasis to change around those midweek spaces. Uh, we're not reinventing the wheel here, but what we wanna do with these gastric communities is they're not gonna end each term. They're just gonna carry on. So people can journey into deeper connection, deeper friendship over a longer, much longer period of time. We're also gonna have all the, all the communities are on the same page. We're all gonna study the same stuff. We're all gonna journey together at the same time through, through prayer and, uh, and reading the Bible and, uh, and all the things that encompass what it means to, 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 to live a radical life, disciple to Jesus. We're gonna do it together. We're gonna journey together. And over the coming weeks, we're gonna share more about how that's gonna happen, what that's gonna look like. And our hope and our prayer is that every person who comes to Gas Street regularly, every person that calls this home would step up and be part of one of those Gas Street communities because you cannot separate believing from belonging, but neither can you separate belonging from serving cannot separate believing from belonging and you can't separate belonging from serving. There's this moment right at the beginning of Jesus's ministry in uh, Luke 5 and Jesus has climbed into a fishing boat in order to teach the crowd that has gathered on the lake at Gennesaret. And the fishermen who own these boats, they're washing their nets. And as Jesus finishes preaching, he turns to Peter, one of the fishermen, and he says, hey, why don't you let out your nets for a catch? And Peter, I love Peter. I so relate to Peter. And I can imagine Peter kind of giving Jesus the side eye at this point, like, yeah, good one, preacher. We've been fishing all night and we've caught nothing, but there's something about Jesus that makes Peter do it anyway. Uh, and so this is what we read in, uh, in Luke 5. It says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. We need partners to haul in and to care for the catch of fish. We need partners. You know, it, it is amazing what is happening. It, it is remarkable what God is doing, but with only a quarter of the church currently serving on team and with only a quarter of the church currently giving financially, regularly to the church, honestly, the nets are breaking. The nets are breaking and I know it doesn't always look like that around here but trust me be assured when I tell you there are some areas of church life where the nets are breaking this morning at the 9 30 gathering we had two people on the hello and welcome team two people to greet everyone that comes to be part of this church the nets are breaking, we need partners who will serve because you cannot separate believing from belonging and you cannot separate belonging from serving. And we desperately need people who will just roll up their sleeves and serve. 
And you know, that includes you young people. There are spaces and opportunities for you to serve too. We would love to see you guys serving. There are ways that you can sign up. You know, recently I read uh, a book by Philip Yancey called Rumors of Another World. And there's a chapter in this book called God Loves Adverbs. And if you are any grammar geeks, any of our young people love grammar? Oh, Becky's a grammar geek. Grammar geek, I'm looking at my daughter. She corrects my grammar quite frequently. Then you'll know that an adverb is the word that's used in a sentence to describe the verb. So for example, let me give you an example. Rachel preached masterfully. Oh yeah, I came up with that all by myself. And so in that sentence, the verb is preach and the adverb is masterfully. But see how the sentence changes when you switch up the adverb. So I could say instead, Rachel preached humbly. Maybe that's a, a, a better sentence. And so what Philip Yancey is getting at is that yes, yes, of course, God is interested in what we do. He's interested in the verbs of our lives. Of course, he cares uh, that we use our God-given gifts and talents uh, to, uh, to fulfill our kingdom-oriented potential, of course, but God cares way more about how we do it, about how we go about it. He, he cares way more about how we do the doing. God loves adverbs. And you know, before we planted Gas Street, Tim and I were part of a church called HTB in London. In fact, that was the church that planted us out. And we had 10 really happy, wonderful years there at HTB. And we're still so grateful for all that we learned there. And you know, when we first joined the church and we joined the staff team, Tim was the worship pastor, I was part of the media team, but I also volunteered. I also served at the church on a Sunday by being in the worship team. I was a backing vocalist. And if you sit on the front row, row you'll be able to hear my harmonies. They're wonderful. And I would also preach occasionally and I was starting to lead gatherings and I absolutely loved serving the church in that way. I felt like some of these new gifts that I was discovering were being developed, and these were also sort of serving roles that had visibility. I was stood on a stage, and with visibility comes recognition. And let's be honest, recognition feels really good. And then a couple of years into our time at HTB, I became a mum for the first time, and my whole life changed. And because Tim was employed to be at church all day on a Sunday, uh, Practically speaking, it meant that I stepped back as, uh, as being a part of the worship team and, and from speaking and from leading for a time so that I could care for our little one. But I really wanted to carry on serving at the church in some way, albeit with a little one in tow. And at about the same time, the amazing women who had been running the stay and play group at church uh, decided that it was, it was time to, to hand it on. Their kids had grown up and it was time to pass the baton on. Uh, and some bright spark suggested that maybe I would be a good option for taking it on. And if I'm being totally honest, I was not in the least bit interested in running a stay and play group. Stay and play groups are really hard work to run, let me tell you. There is nothing glamorous about running a stay and play group. It is like week in, week out commitment. It's like grubby floors and snotty noses, and it's pretty unseen. It's kind of mucking, kind of serving. It wasn't a ministry really that people took much notice of, and I was not keen. I was not keen, but because I now had a little one in tow, I had a slightly vested interest, so I thought I'd show up. So I started going each week, and you know what happened? God began to break my heart for the mums that gathered there, like really break my heart. And God began to give me a vision for what it might look like if these mums 
began to feel more, more connected to God, uh, more connected to one another, more connected into their local communities. Uh, and you see, what I've discovered is, is that part of, part of the call that's on my life is to gather and empower women. God's just put it on my heart to do that. And when it comes to the call that God has put on your life, honestly, it doesn't matter whether it's two and a half thousand women gathering in the ICC or a handful of knackered mums in a church hall. It doesn't matter because God loves adverbs. God cares about the heart. And you know what, it was hard work. It was hard work. I would show up every Thursday, whether I felt like it or not, because I knew that there were mums relying on me setting up those toys and putting out those biscuits. And it was snotty noses, and it was grubby floors, but it was also absolutely beautiful. It was the power of God at work. It was unglamorous, it was unseen, but God moved profoundly in that space. Local moms found faith in Jesus. Women found connection and, and community and belonging and purpose in that season. Deep, enduring friendship began. We raised money to, to build a preschool in Malawi, which I got to go out and see, and you know, what I had initially thought of as like a serving downgrade actually became some of the most precious and fruitful years of serving. God loves adverbs. And I wonder if sometimes the danger can be we can discount ourselves from serving because we are overly concerned with the verb. We're overly concerned with what we might do what we might do to serve when God is actually way more interested in how we do it, in the adverb. Or maybe we think, you know what, I'll only serve if I can serve in this particular way. Don't hear me wrong. As a church, we really wanna match up gifting with need. We wanna match up God-given natural ability with the need that is in front of us. And we wanna keep doing that over and over again. But honestly, we also need a whole bunch of people just to serve. This church is full of amazing, gifted, extraordinarily talented individuals who have looked around, seen the need and said, let me help, let me serve, let me serve. We cannot separate believing from belonging and neither can we separate belonging from serving. You know, imagine if I stood in front of my dishwasher at home and I looked at my dishwasher and it needed unloading and reloading. I don't stand in front of my dishwasher and think, hmm, does this play to my strengths? Like is unloading and reloading the dishwasher like a real passion of mine? Do my talents match the need? Does this warrant all my experience? No, I look at the dishwasher and I think it needs unloading and reloading and quite frankly, my kids aren't gonna do it so I just better crack on. Honestly, we need people who are more concerned with the adverb than with the verb, who are ready to serve. And let me say this as I finish. We really want serving on a team at Gas Street to be a positive experience. We really want serving on a team at Gas Street to be a life-giving experience, a, a place where friendships are formed, a, a place where skills are developed, where faith is strength, strengthened, where character is formed. And, and you know, if you've served on a team and that hasn't been your experience, I am so sorry. We know there's work to be done. Would you give us another chance? Would you give it another, another go? We want it to be an experience of life, but we need partners. Maybe if the band come up, we need partners. There are places where the nets are breaking. 
And so I'll leave you with this question just as we pray. Are you part of Gas Street, but with one foot in? Is it time today to jump with two feet into all that God is doing, to roll up your sleeves and to serve, to partner with us in seeing what God is doing as we pursue this vision wholeheartedly to be light for the city and beyond.